Hi. Oh, Christine. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing. We just re we just recorded. We were just being silly, and uh, it was it got me all tickled. Goof. Couple, couple of goofballs. Couple of silly geese, you know. Mm. Uh, how are you? I feel like. So much has happened since I've seen you, but also not really. Like, well, you know, I'm recovering from herpes, as you can see on my face. Are you actually? Yeah, I have. Um, do you have a, you have herpes? I didn't know that. Simplex well, what two? What's the, the cold situation? sores? I don't know. I don't know what they're called, but it fucking sucks. Mm, I've had them sucks. since I was a baby, but uh, yeah. I so I'm you know I'm okay. Thank you for asking. I've been I've lo I've looked like um quite a gremlin for several days now because i really just had like cold so okay it's because we've been doing so much traveling and we were so overwhelmed and like it was just and blaze and leona came which is like awesome obviously but then there's the but downside also exhausting it's so much more work and like packing and you know just like i don't know all the logistics and it's just been a very crazy couple of weeks for our touring um and the last day of the trip i woke up and my whole face had just like completely yeah. broken out in in like these fucking giant cold sores my whole body like shut down i was like okay i've clearly been i i think it i think um i mean i obviously didn't have the exact same situation but i think it's i've accepted at this point that like okay after tour like i'm gonna burn out like it's i'm gonna have wild it's a lot. It's a well. Also, it's because it's a lot of um, short travel hopping. Where like yeah. I feel like when I'm at home, I'm just on a really long layover. Like it. Yeah, and you don't really get a minute to like breathe. And you know, New we were in New York, and it's just so much craziness happening back to back to back. And also, this isn't this isn't me trying to like make our my sob story worse than yours because this just happened to be, um, just because these last shows happened to be on the east coast it just for me and eva in particular it's a harder travel oh, yeah. because it it's two extra travel days which happens to you when you come to the west coast and it's oh man it's just from going to florida to then having to coming home for like basically to pack just to go back to the east coast Whew, yeah. it's a doozy so i'm shocked I, you don't have herpes too i gave you hand to <laughs> mouth i'm waiting well we did make out after that show yeah so right true so it's just bound to happen <laughs> uh no but i you know what i'm gonna i did it's interesting you bring that up, and I don't have I don't have what you have. But to bounce back to a few episodes ago, when your baby gave me mm -hmm. uh, hand, foot, and mouth is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. I still, I just every time I say it, I sound like my mother because every time I say the name of it, it's three different body parts. I'm like <laughs> leg, arm, and tongue. Elbow, you know? knee, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so. Uh, look at us naming body parts we're so impressive look at us. what a hilarious the comedy show we do <laughs> well so uh recent developments after all of you know that cleared up on my face obviously i've been fine for a while but um i still had uh blisters that were healing this entire time on the bottom of my feet mm. and yesterday um they decided that it was time to open cool. and um, <laughs> are you one of those people who likes to see gross pictures or no? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you a picture and we- Unless maybe... it's a needle and then I don't want it. No, 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 no. But I will show you, um, I'm glad I asked first because this is a real doozy. <laughs> I'm glad um, you asked first too. <laughs> uh, so basically my entire heel became one big, big open blister. Cool. And uh, I'm just going to text you. I'm not going to text you. I was going to say, because we Eva's did not get vomit. the consent yet from Eva. I am pretty sure uh, Eva is not a gross also, image. Also, like, as, our, as her employer, technically, I feel like oh, yeah. that's kind of a line that maybe we should leave her out of, you know? Okay, gross so that's... Body part pictures. So that's what it looked like, um, and that's how I knew it was time. Okay, hold on. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> And that's so, a gnarly one. So both of my feet look like that. Oof, uh, uh, you know what it looks so, like? What? Those things you put on your feet. It looks like an infomercial for like. And then all you... the skin comes off. Yeah. Yeah. But like literally like it's like almost <laughs> like. <laughs> oh, I just thought this thing. Oh, 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 oh Eva, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's gnarly. It does look like my foot had been sitting in like leather or something and like just the, the whole foot fell off so 
Um, it's very disgusting. But that's what happened to me as soon as I got off the plane, and I was like, oh, okay. Well, at least now I think we can finally say that the disease it's has passed. run its course. Yeah, it's, run it's officially its course. done. So okay. I'm sorry that you're now suffering with sores on your face. Been there. Anyway, but... I don't have any great photos of it for you, but uh... <laughs> if you do send them though, because I love a gross picture. Blech. Yeah, they're uh, they're not fun. I've been getting cold sores since I was a baby. It just sucks, you know. I'm does sure it, everybody does. It just feel like cank. I've had canker sores, like the like, oh, the ones like in around. your mouth. Yeah, like... it's similar, but it's almost like they're just so painful <laughs> like they're really painful and mm. anything that touches like so i'll get them on one part of my lip and but then it's like it spreads because it t anything it like touches so it's like your whole mouth just gets what's uh, the what's the radius like if it if you touch the sore and then you like scratch your face can it go happen up here i don't or think it, so i know you can because <laughs> never mind i shouldn't say um i know Hmm. How do What's I put this delicately? Hmm. Uh, I know that it is possible to be transferred from mouth to someone's genitalia. Mm -hmm. So yes. I know that that's a thing. Um, but I don't think it spreads like on your skin. I think it's like typically your mouth and you're down there. Uh huh. Understood. Yeah. The Understood. Well, that's, listen, that's what Google tells me. Okay, people, I don't have any other answers for you. Well, I'm sorry you're going through that. It's, I don't know how to make it better for you, but... Uh, I know. You can uh, tell me a ghost story. What a sagu. Um, so, interestingly, my story this week... I actually did these notes before, like, our Florida show. Whoa. So, we're going to be learning together. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have definitely forgotten this information. Um, but so... I do remember the way that I got to this information is because I was something happened in the news at, at this point. I feel bad because when I did these notes, I thought I would be recording soon and the information would be relevant mm. and topical. But now it's probably been a little while and people are over it. I don't And care. then it's going to come out in like a month and we're going to be like, well, yeah. So we're discussing it now. Sorry, folks. Uh, but uh, people kept tagging me in this news that there was an incident with a Ouija board and several students. I don't and... know anything. I'm shocked that I didn't see this. Usually I'm like, you know, tagged every now and then in these. And like, I just see the glimpse of it. Um, but no, I've never even heard of this. Well, so I looked that up and I thought, okay, maybe I'll cover it as a whole story. But it ended up kind of just being like a short news article that was getting copy and pasted to every source. And right. more or less the same article every time I looked it up. So um, I am going to talk about it real quick but the what ended up happening afterwards so i was like wow that was really interesting i wonder what else is going on in paranormal news and mm. that leads into today's actual story mm. so um just to update everybody in case you're christine and did not know about this ouija board incident uh this happened february 27th of this year 2023 and there were 28 girls in columbia at i hope i'm saying it right Gal galeris uh, educational institution. Uh, so they were students at the school and all 28 girls were hospitalized <gasps> after having anxiety and fainting episodes. Oh no. And, and many parents of the girls blamed a Ouija board that the Ooh. girls were playing with right before they passed out. So um, is this a school? Well, are you going to, you're telling this story, right? Before I ask mm -hmm. questions that are obvious. Okay. You Never can mind. ask the questions anyway. Well, I was just wondering, is it like, a, how old were they? Was it like a high school or like a high college? School. A high school. High okay. school. Um, so it's unclear if the Ouija board was like used at school for a class or if someone like brought Ooh, it in or something. Professor I... M's class. No, not <laughs> Professor. <laughs> Professor Christine's class. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You would professor... not allow that behavior. <laughs> if you and I were professors at the same school, I'd be like, I request the building across yeah, as far away as possible. Yeah, you would have a possible. feud. It would be so wild. Um, so the protocol that, you know, came out of this was that they sent the children to the hospital and the school as of when I did these notes, is now awaiting medical reports before any updates for oh, the public. My oh my. But, but two of the students um, that were hospitalized had pre-existing medical conditions, but not the other 26. Yeah, so, and also like same, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> is it a, specifically a fainting disease? Maybe, I don't know. 
hey, I'm going through it right now. So that's maybe. That's true. You literally are. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> maybe it's because of that time you made me play with a Ouija board, Christine. Wait, don't you dare piggyback on these people. <laughs> don't you dare. I'm not participating in that. Well, so this story, which like I'm, it could have been. It could have been as simple as like, oh, a group of girls that all go to the same school together played with the Ouija board. And then right. it is weird that all of a sudden they all start having a fainting, yeah. fainting spells. Um, but the story kind of started spreading like wildfire. And the head of the school, he asked people not to spread any more information because they were causing hysteria in their like community. Oh, no. Especially because there's no evidence of Ouija board caused illnesses, to be clear. Mm. Um, but... There's this one guy who enters the scene, which I thought was so odd. His name is Chris DeFlorio, and he's a former NYPD cop, um, and he gave up his life as a cop and became an exorcist. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We were that- just talking about, uh, what is it called, uh, the death files or dead files, and the cop yeah. who like now does a ghost show, and I'm like, his name is also like dis something Oh, like they're It's all- always like a like a tough bookie kind of. Yeah. What is the... Uh, hold know. on. I want to look up dead files cop. <laughs> oh, DeShavi. Kind of so it's like, what's this guy? Dis something O. DeFlorio. DeFlorio, DeShavi, they're all leaving the force. They should have their to- own their own tag team like law like and order sh- oh, paranormal interesting i would watch that on discovery plus for sure i would i would for sure uh but anyway he became an exorcist and he runs a nonprofit in new york called <laughs> the demonic investigation <laughs> sorry nonprofit. <laughs> okay <laughs> i know and he uh he claims that what happened is when the girls were using the ouija board they opened a doorway to evil which oh no that seems kind of like you didn't have to become an exorcist to guess that. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people probably but guessed you probably it. probably did that have kept to their become jobs. Um, an NYPD cop to, to get, figure that one out, though. Yeah, he you know had just, I mean? he, he had a hunch. And you the know Academy how, they, really they taught him about. They love their hunches. <laughs> Portals to evil. <laughs> so I feel like he had that hunch on a different case. And they were like, you should leave yeah, this maybe job and go be find something a new, else. a new hobby. <laughs> And he did. So he now travels uh, the country performing exorcisms with his wife. So that's oh, a power this couple right there. like what's Shemacolum's? The Warrens? Yeah, a little bit. Or just like the ghost power couple type thing. I think because there's so few power couples yeah, in the paranormal world. Yeah, that's true. Worlds. There's nothing else similar except the ghost part. Yeah. So uh, he travels with his wife. They do exorcisms. And... Uh, when asked about the case, he said it is not an isolated event that these 28 girls ended up hospitalized from using a Ouija board because there are officially five schools in Colombia that have had incidents. Mm. A- incidents? Incidences? I After... think it's incidents. I, it's one of my pet peeves because it's like an incident. Incidents. So it's okay. incidents. You're right. I, I don't know. I hope I'm right. Otherwise, Twitter will tell me. Anyway, they said uh, he says that there are officially five different schools in Colombia that have had a Ouija board caused incident. What um, the fuck? One included a group of teenagers after playing with a Ouija board, all having abdominal pain, muscle spasms, and then passing out. Oh. And 11 students were injured and five were hospitalized. Oh my God. So that's one of the other cases that sounds similar, I guess, to him. It happens to be in Columbia. They're high school students, and it's all after they've played it's with weird. the board. Um, most of the cases, I will say, have been dismissed as, like, they were playing with a Ouija board and then came in contact with contaminated food or water. And it could just be, like, food poisoning. <laughs> Are they just, like, constantly playing Ouija boards down there? Yeah. And it just happens to be, like, the only thing they can point to? It's so odd. Yeah, I have no idea. But he- we do leave off on a quote from him that says, one possibility is that something evil is happening in the area that is targeting children spiritually and is not being addressed. But a lot of people are also like, it's just food poisoning. contaminated water. <laughs> yeah, it's just food poisoning. Oh, no. Um, anyway, that all made that's That's the story of what's going on. There are 28 girls and we don't know any updates. So it, it became kind of a bit of a dud oh, for I me see. to cover it fully. Oh, I see. Okay. So then I was like, well, what else is going on in the paranormal world? And that's when I learned, I never learned how to say this word either. Um, so um, oh, I'm ready. I'm my, ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, it's the production company that does all the scary movies. Is it Blumhouse or Blumhouse? I say oh, Blumhouse. Shit. I don't Blumhouse. I think, I think it's Blumhouse. 
I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's Bloom. I don't know. I don't know. Microsoft Christine. I thought you were going to handle well, it with I'm the words. I'm sorry with the with the proper nouns. I'm no good. You know what I okay. mean. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So I was looking into paranormal news, and it said that Blumhouse acquired the rights to the <gasps> story of the Moffat family haunting. So since they've acquired this. The story to this haunting I never heard of. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to look into that. And that's how we get to my topic today, which is the Moffat family story. Oh, man. I can't wait. So there is the mom, Deborah, and uh, there is a daughter, Jessica. That's mainly who we talk about today. Um, and in 2015, Deborah wrote a book called Unwelcomed, the true story of the Moffat family haunting. Mm. And it, seven years later, last year, 2022, Jessica published an article about their story in HuffPost. And I got to give this article specifically a shout out um, because this was Jessica's firsthand account. A lot of quotes from mm. from this, from my notes, come directly from her. Um, and the one thing that I want to mention is that uh, in some of the sources I saw, it said that they called the ghost that was haunting them Mr. Entity. Ew! hate it hate but, it but i never saw that in her actual article so i don't know if that's true or maybe that's like maybe that's like a bloom house uh yeah like revision you know just like a little artistic license and that's i'm saying bloom house because you're saying blum house so that one of us one is of, right one of just us is right yeah. for fun <laughs> makes total sense uh but yeah so in theory the spirit is called mr entity but i didn't see that uh, come out of jessica's article so i just didn't really say anything about it um but anyway I'm going to start out hot with a quote. My grandmother constantly warned my brothers and me never to speak about anything we witnessed in our home. Mm. And here I am writing an article on HuffPost.com. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, grandma. So uh, the family lived in Rancho and it was... Rancho. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, has a minor league team I'm obsessed with, the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. Yeah. Um, and so Jessica lived with her brothers, her mom, her dad, and then her grandma named Lee. And uh, Jessica says that the house was very creepy. The family definitely had PTSD living there as mm. far as she can remember. But she didn't totally know why. She just remembered, especially her dad and her grandma, being freaked the fuck out in their house for what she thought was no reason. She was just like, they are so paranoid and I don't know what's going on. Weird. And here's a quote about that. The strangest sight of all was the unexplained behavior of my family. At sunset, dad would creep through the halls like a trespasser. After dark, he wouldn't leave my parents' bedroom unless mom or one of the kids escorted him. Grandma oh. gave a panicked once over to every room she entered, no matter the time of day. Oh my God. That must be traumatizing alone as a child to be like, why are my parents so scared? Oh, so then she goes into saying that this behavior and the secrecy of like, don't talk about what's going on in the house, even though she didn't know what was going on in the house, except them acting weird. <laughs> um, this behavior made Jessica a little bit of like a recluse for a while Aww. and like made her really introverted. She became really reserved. Um, and she even said she would hide away in the house instead of make friends. Mm. Um, and she often danced around speaking her mind because she didn't, she was always like kind of, you know, am I going to slip up if I say this? Am I going to slip oh, up? Oh, I thought so, you meant she danced around the house speaking her mind. Oh, oh, <laughs> no. Like, Whoa, that doesn't seem very reserved to me, but I guess in M land that is not extroverted enough. <laughs> she danced around speaking her mind. <laughs> I think you dance. guys are crazy. That's what she said to her dad and grandma. <laughs> oh boy. Pot of beret, pot of beret. You're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> well, let me guess. Macbeth's tights also had a part in the fucking play. <laughs> okay, no, she metaphorically danced around the concept of okay. speaking her mind. My bad. Sorry, I really need to figure out how to how to speak. No, at 30 it's years not old. you. I think my brain just sometimes combines things and goes, "What a cool visual image," and then realizes that's not what's happening. <laughs> well, <laughs> unfortunately, no. Uh, but so, and then basically, her behavior it, it made her feel really introverted for a while. Um, and after her grandma and father passed away, it was just her and her mom at the house. And her mom was cleaning out uh, the bedroom closet and found a bunch of old photos. Mm. 
So Jessica said, this is a a longer quote, but very crucial to the story. Um, so it's just the two of them after everyone's passed and her mom found these photos. And Jessica says, I assume she was reviewing the happy memories from her life with my father. But when I looked at the photographs, I didn't understand what I was seeing. Every photograph was strange, some horrifying. A knife thrust into a picture of my grandmother on the wall. Huh? A group a group of bizarre shapes scratched into a door. Bright words written on a mirror that read, Lee, die. Ah! Oh! And all of a sudden, it's now clicking like something is going on in this house. What the one, fuck? One photo. Um, I, I guess there were a few photos, but one that I saw. Um, on the floor... There was like, it looked like powder. It looked like baby powder or something that was drawn into like weird shapes. Like it was like a squiggly arrow one time, but it it looked like, like all this was being written out basically in baby powder, either on the rug or like (sighs) somehow on a bathroom mirror, but it was always this weird white writing. Gross. Um, And it was all over the house when she was a kid. So now she's seeing pictures of it and it's in an eerie way and. So her mom says this. This is a quote from her mom. I can't believe your father kept any of these photos. He and your grandmother were afraid to talk about it. They thought we'd bring it back if we did. You're going to you're going to have a hard time believing what I want to tell you. No. Maybe I shouldn't. You and your brothers have come along this far without knowing, but something horrible happened to us a long time ago. It's up to you if you want to hear it. There was something with us for a long time. Some people told us it was a ghost or a demon. We only knew it as the entity. Okay, let's just take a breath. I'm really freaked out already. I was then- like, oh, uh, it's up to you if you want to know. It's like, well, now I have to know. Thanks a lot, mom. <laughs> Jesus. It's I feel like-, like after I saw pictures of like a knife stabbed through my True. grandma's face, I'd be like, mm. I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> yeah, like maybe let me just live in my own world where this is all a fun play, a skit <laughs> that they I were feel doing. Like, I feel like that one quote from that one article is what Blumhouse was like, we have to totally get the rights to this. Um, But yeah, she was like, something happened to us a long time ago. And Jessica asked, were we haunted? And the mom said, we were terrorized. <gasps> Goose cam. Goose cam. I wonder if that'll be the first clip of the movie. So what, me saying goose cam? Oh, no. no. That, it was like, oh, yeah, I doubt it, Em, but maybe. It's actually a Jessica Potabereng throughout the kitchen. So brave with her speaking of the mind. So brave. Aww. So in 1987, this is where the story now takes place. In 1987, before Jessica was born, um, it all started with that white writing that appeared on the mirror in the bathroom. And it was the first time that there was ever writing on this mirror. And it said no escape oh cool good start eventually the home would see regular poltergeist activity um and it was all documented in these saved pictures which dear christine i just might have for you no all right eva you don't need to consent to these okay don't worry i don't think they're as scary (laughs) as m's foot they're nothing's as scary as my foot that was (laughs) that's the ultimate trigger warning um okay so these are a lot of pictures, I gotta be honest. Um, That's fine. But I am I would rather us post some of them, like, maybe throughout the episode, like, put them in the corner or something so people can see, and then we'll put some on Instagram, too. Ooh, okay. Um, okay, so here is the first sign of activity. Oh. Uh, okay, so that was the first one, and then here's um, some of the arrows. Like, this is, like, some of the other white writing that they would find around the house. Oh, no. That's not good. And then, as I just said, they were dealing with a lot of poltergeist activity, yeah. such as this. You know that creeps me out, by the way, the poltergeist shit. Oh, my God. Oh, my yep. God. Okay, folks. It is a four-poster bed that has just been, like, oop, tilted diagonally and propped like it's almost- up. Yeah, it's like le- maybe leaning against a wall or something, but it looks like it's flying off the floor. Like, yeah, diagonally almost. It's very unsettling to look at. So that just became part of their norm in the house. Um, Jeez. And apparently the photos were, quote, show uh, the photos that Jessica is now seeing while hearing these stories of like 
paranormal assaults on the house. Yeah. Apparently the photos, quote, showcased daily damages levied against our house with symbols gouged into walls and whole rooms tossed into disarray. What so here's fuck? another picture. This is uh, of their bed just completely ripped apart. <gasps> oh my then, god something has just like torn the foam out of the mattresses like just shredded it looks the mattress. like wolverine came into your yeah. bedroom and then here's some of the um th- shapes that were being etched Ew. into the walls um it looks almost like chalk or like oh no like they scraped through the paint oh god yeah it's real crazy and it's then like um, an arrow and a rectangle and a plus sign yeah, and so, yeah, so there's a bunch of weird writing going on on the walls, on the floors. Things are being lifted off the ground, being torn apart. And more writing would up later appear to the family instead of just no escape and these weird little shapes. Okay. Um, eventually, the writing would turn into, quote, demands, insults, threats, every message conveyed was a chilling human intelligence. Hmm. Don't like that. If the family tried to leave, by the way, because a lot of people say, well, why don't you just leave Mm -hmm. a house like this? Um, The entity would follow them. And apparently it would leave these same words and signs on windows where they were staying. So basically they're just screwed. Yeah, it's it's following them everywhere. And the leading theory seems to be that it was following wherever grandma went. Um, (gasps) Oh, I see. And noticeably out of all the activity... Grandma Lee was the prime focus of the spirit, and Mm. she would be terrorized by this thing. She would feel chased. There were items of hers that would move or be broken. Um, Literal knives were found in her furniture. I don't know if that was like like she might accidentally sit on it or something. But then, as I mentioned, there... Here, I'll send you that picture. This is a knife in their (gasps) family tree. It just oh, appeared. in the family tree is very spooky because it's like a picture of her on the yeah. tree and the knife is directly in her picture only. And, and in there's a, a wall. little dog down there. At least it didn't go to the dog. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so now they're just walking around and finding knives in their walls. Cool. Uh, and so again, she would feel chased. Things would happen to her. And she allegedly thought that this spirit was a punishment from God because her dad was apparently like all of ours apparently a hitman for the mob oh um, i was like what are you about to say all of our dads are what <laughs> well it sounds like all of us are somehow connected yeah, and yeah. uh but so apparently her dad was a hitman for the mob and so she always thought that the the <gasps> spirit was coming after her as like a punishment for mm. her relationship with him and even creepier one time some of the writing on the mirror said that the grandma belonged to the entity I don't like that one bit. So the family reached out to anyone in the paranormal world that would be willing to help. Apparently they even reached out to the Warrens and Lorraine said uh, that when she went into the house, that it was a powerful demon, which like, duh, like I don't need to be, (laughs) I don't need to be Lorraine Warren to tell you a random knife in my face on a wall is like not good news. (laughs) But you do need to go to the police academy and join the (laughs) NYPD because that's where you learn all of this stuff. And then quit to become the actress I've always been, (laughs) I've always been destined to be. Um, So a parapsychologist also investigated and believed that the spirit was so active. This is like where it gets maybe a little true crimey, Christine. So, Oh, boy. A parapsychologist investigated and said, okay, there is something here, but it must be so active because, like, it, the only way it's this active is because someone is allowing it to be here and giving it permission to stick around the house. Oh. So now we got a whodunit kind of thing who of who, done is, it. who is keeping this door open between both worlds. Interesting. And, uh... That parapsychologist was on to something, maybe, but it it definitely um, led to a it led to a new theory because okay. the the parapsychologist said, "Oh, someone here must be keeping the worlds open for this thing to come through." But what really happened is the mom later found out she walked into the bathroom one time and caught her father, the grandpa wiping off writing that he had left for the entity on the bathroom mirror oh okay i thought you were gonna say we caught him being the perpetrator 
like he's the entity, like he's writing the things, but you're saying he's egging it on almost. I, so obviously we won't know. I think in a more realistic world, it sounds like maybe grandpa <laughs> that's was. That's what I thought we were going to. <laughs> no, I, that's, that, that might be my personal theory, but the, what we're reading here is that it seemed originally at least like grandpa was egging it on gotcha. instead of being the one causing all this. Gotcha. And like was, but he wasn't in the picture later, right? When it was happening. He was not in the picture later because, so... well, I'll just say oh, this. Sorry. Apparently, okay. <laughs> apparently the conversation that grandpa left on the mirror was urging the entity to kill his wife, grandma Lee, so that he could get her money. Oh, and, I thought he was like defending her, like back off. And it was like egging it on. You're saying he was like in cahoots, either the mm -hmm. demon itself or he's in cahoots with the entity. Yep. Okay. And uh, and because uh, Deborah found this out and learned this about him, she kicked him out and he left. Good. So that's why we don't hear <laughs> about him she's again. Asking the devil to kill his wife. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. a good enough reason. Um, But here's <sighs> so that's. All of that to say, my thought was, okay, maybe he wants her money and he's trying to set this all up to look like it's a paranormal attack, but he really plans on killing her himself for the money. Right. Like, it was just, like, a really creative like a true crime. Weird ruse. Yeah, okay. But even after he left, this is where my, my theory uh -huh. is flawed, is after he left, the activity continued. I see. Okay. So, eventually, Deborah, um, Jessica's mom, she, I guess, was just, like, over whatever was going on, and she just straight up told the spirit to leave, um, which bolds, considering there's been knives at play. Mm hmm And uh, I wonder, though, Deborah sounds like she's more of, like, the force to be reckoned with, and the grandma and Deborah's husband, or Jessica's mom was the force to be reckoned with, while Jessica's dad and grandmother were too afraid of yeah, this Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think Deborah was like, I I'm just going to tell it to leave mm -hmm. and let's see what happens. And I guess on the mirror later, there it said that it wanted to stay. And like, I wonder, are you just standing at the mirror waiting for like a word to right? fade in? Or do you <laughs> close the door and come do back? You, like, or do you blink and it's there and you're like, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it said it wanted to stay and Deborah was like, tough shit gtfo <laughs> it's like please give me one more chance <laughs> yeah i'll be good and at the time uh so she said it had to leave and it just apparently did so okay at the time a paranormal researcher was staying with them to study activity yeah. um because they were bringing in whoever was willing to listen to them and this researcher I don't know what the situation was here, but he was now attached to this entity and wanted the entity to follow him home so he could keep so he could keep researching. And okay. I was like, I was like, OK, that's odd, but sure, it's whatever. Not a great idea, but you do you. It's like, but you want him and I don't. Yeah, so exactly. I, like, I'm not going to trade places with you. Let's just say no that. questions asked. Mm -hmm. So when he left the house uh, after, you know, Deborah said leave. And then the researcher left because she was like, we're not doing this anymore. I told the thing to go away. Right. The researcher left. And once the researcher left and I guess maybe said something like, oh, you can come follow me. After that, there was never activity in Deborah and Jessica's house again. Wow. The last message written on the mirror was goodbye, my family. <laughs> goodbye. You goodbye, kicked me my out. Lover. Goodbye, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, what's her name? Dancing around the house. <laughs> <laughs> speaking her mind <laughs> well so the entity may have left but the damage as we know had definitely traumatically been done to especially <sighs> jessica's father and grandmother who had ptsd for the rest of time in that house always yeah. afraid that it would come back um but again when grandma and the dad passed it was just deborah left with the kids and deborah didn't want to not talk about it anymore or the two people who were the most scared weren't there. So Deborah right. was like, I'll say something. And her kids were very supportive and didn't want to live in secrecy. Um, so they ended up telling all their friends. Their friends were very open about it and encouraged them to go public. And that is when they remember feeling for the first time that they didn't have to dance around with their words. 
Okay. And for the first time, uh, Jessica felt, quote, the thrill of being free from secrets. Aww. And Deborah and Jessica have now been actively, they talk to the press and they've shared their stories with people in the paranormal world. And they do, uh, they deal with their share of skeptics. But Jessica has said, I just want others to know what happened. Wow. And now everyone's going to know because of Blumhouse bought their story so or did bloomhouse nobody knows who <laughs> someone did <laughs> uh and that is the moffat family haunting okay well this is exciting because it's like well now you've presented two stories that are going to have updates presumably that the yeah. one in columbia we're waiting on more information and then this movie's going to come out which i'm sure will spark a whole new interest yeah. in it cool am nailing it hey anyway i i hope you liked it i I enjoyed learning with everybody because that was um a you pre- did good. I it did not occur to me. show research. <laughs> yeah, it did not occur to me that you did not uh know what was going on. So good. I you nailed you. it. <laughs> oh, okay. I am going to tell you about a cold case ish. All right, so I have a story for you today, Em. Um, I'm I'm a little nervous now to tell you what it is because about two minutes ago when I told you for the first time your computer froze and it looked like you were just staring at me <laughs> blankly and I was like, wow, you hate this already and we're one line in, but you're back and moving again. So um, I'll try. Yeah. Okay, this is the story. It's a, it's a cold case-ish. You know I love hate a cold exactly, case. Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping the ish maybe adds a little bit of comfort we'll see okay this is the lewis clark valley killer i don't know what that is i I thought for a second you were going to tell like the true crime of like lewis clark and i was like oh i know that guy and then well that's two guys lewis and clark but yes lewis and clark shit yeah but okay well i don't know apparently (laughs) <laughs> it, it makes sense because that's who this area is named after lewis and clark so mm-hmm. you know you're onto something um and i'm sure that true crime deserves to be covered as well but for today we're doing a more modern day story not quite modern day but 70s 80s so uh the documentary i watched about this it's a two-parter and it's called cold valley on discovery plus or amazon um it's very good i really enjoyed it so if you're looking for um you know uh more of a deep dive on the story i would watch that um and that's where a lot of this information came from so the lewis clark valley killer was active from 1979 to 1982 in the lewis clark valley and this valley as we've kind of already discussed um is named as such because it's where lewis and clark once uh, camped when they were cross-country trekking mm-hmm. and so it's on the border of washington and idaho at the convergence of the snake river and the clearwater river and there were three towns in this valley where these crimes occurred there was a soton which is a-s-o-t-i-n a soton clarkston and lewiston and this whole area is very rural um at the time of the three towns, Lewiston had the biggest population at just under 30,000. Clarkston had 7,000 and Asotin didn't even have a thousand people in its town. Oh, wow. On the census in 1980. Yeah. So very, very small. And because it's the seventies, it's just very small town. You know, obviously nobody's locking their doors. Um, you know, a lot of these places to this day, you don't really concern yourself with you know the big city dangers um and so you know locals who grew up there said it was a great place to grow up kids would bike to each other's houses to school unsupervised um obviously nobody locked their doors so on a pretty average day on april 28th 1979 uh 12 year old christina she's also known as chrissy set out on her bike alone uh so chrissy white she was very excited to go to a like street festival or like a county fair, uh, like a small county fair. And so she had gone to a morning parade with her mom and her six year old sister. Oh, okay. She planned to hang out with her friend Rose after the fair. And, you know, she was kind of her brothers called her a tomboy. She was kind of just an independent little kid. Uh, Her brother explained she wasn't squeamish about putting worms on her hook. Like she liked to be outdoors and, you know, in 
that day, it was probably slightly more unusual, I guess, for girls to be that independent. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they called it a tomboy. And so she was just a easygoing, fun loving 12 year old girl. She's on the walk home from the parade and she and her mom part ways once she reaches her friend Rose's house. And a few hours later, Chrissy called home and said she was sick from the heat. Mm. So according to Chrissy's brother, she was not great about drinking water, keeping herself hydrated. And so she sometimes in, in the summer. <laughs> None of us are, I know, by I was going to say, relatable, I guess. Reminder, everyone, this is, your, this is your daily reminder to drink some water. Sip, sip. Hmm. Okay. Just, I couldn't imagine a better sagu into that. So. Right? I know. No. I needed a little hydration. So she was the type to get overheated pretty easily. And this was nothing new. So her mom told her, okay, honey, drape yourself with a cool, wet towel um, and lie down for a while and then come home when you feel better, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when Chrissy didn't call back later on, her mom just assumed she and her friend Rose had gone to the fair together. But Chrissy never came home that night. And Chrissy's family reported her missing that evening. But, you know, at this point, it's been hours. So the odds are already against them. Right. What's more is that the chief of police at the time had only been on the job for six months. He'd never even trained as a police officer. He'd never been to academy. Um, And he basically says in this documentary, like, I was not sure where to start. Like, he's brand spanking new, never done any sort of official police training. And now they're like, there's a missing child. So this This is like... This poor guy. Oh, my God. I know. In this tiny ass town. So this is like totally out of the ordinary. Uh, So... Searchers assumed they would find her, you know, just out on her bike, maybe lost or hurt. Uh, And so that is where they started. They started looking. Um, The last place she had been seen was sometime between 7 and 10 p.m. biking near her house. So they took flashlights and they went out searching everywhere they could. But there was absolutely no trace of Chrissy. So in the following days, her father used his friend's helicopter service and they were able to do an aerial search of the valley Again, they found not a single trace of her. Um, It was as if she'd poof, you know, ceased to exist, just vanished in thin air. Mm. So it was three weeks later that they have got their first and pretty much only piece of evidence in this case. Uh, A farmer named Mr. Flynn was out in his pasture when he came across some papers and they had Mm. Chrissy White's name on them. Oh, And they were her, it was her homework, like her schoolwork. Oh. I know. Well, that's and heartbreaking. It, it, it's heartbreaking. And like when you watch the documentary as well, they do kind of a close up on it in the evidence bag. And it it has like a B plus in red pen. Like you can Aww. even see the writing on it. It's just really heartbreaking. And so here's the weird thing, though. It's been three weeks since she vanished. But these papers are in like great condition as if they've just been dropped oh. there like that morning. Huh. So. He immediately obviously calls authorities and he, you know, he's a farmer. He, this is his land. He knows that if these papers had been out there for more than two days, they would have been, you know, roughed up by the weather. Covered Um, in dirt and muck and all that. Yeah, yeah. At least some sign of being outside. But yeah, he said they couldn't have been there for more than two days. And so this was like the first break they had. So now they're wondering, you know, did the abductor keep Chrissy somewhere nearby for a while uh, or were they just now or had they already, you know, killed her and were just discarding evidence like nobody could really figure out uh, what was going on. And unfortunately, those papers were the only physical evidence ever uncovered in Christina White's case. So mm. to this day, no sign of her, no other clues. It's just really shocking. Like she just vanished. So after this, of course, a small town like this is rattled and you know, the way people behave changes. Parents start driving their kids to school instead of letting them go by themselves. Um, people start, you know, being much more careful of where their kids are, who they're with, what house they're at, you know, just keeping track. Um, and so it was, people were on alert, if you will. Mm-hmm. And one big part of that was, is this person somebody we know, you know, is this person somebody in our community or could this person have just been passing through and, you know, discard the evidence and moving on? Yeah. So things kind of settled and people got back into their normal day-to-day routines um, until a few years later in 1981 when another girl vanished. 
Oy. Yeah. It's almost like the minute things start to just settle, um, you know, among families. Happens again. Yeah, just like, bam, another another hand grenade. So 22-year-old Kristen David was a college student at the University of Idaho, and she was another girl who was known to be independent and outdoorsy and did a lot of things on her own. She was very athletic. She enjoyed biking. And on June 26 of 81, she decided to set out on a three-hour bike ride from Moscow, Idaho, um, which is where she was at college, to Lewiston, Idaho, which uh, is where she is f- was from. Oof. So 30-mile trek. Uh, oh, my but- God downhill Sorry. most most of the way but you know con- to, that means uphill back that means the, the uh, <laughs> this is later tr- this is true i like to think that her mom was gonna drive her back or something after the downhill part but i don't know oh okay that makes more sense i was like at least you downhill second Jesus. yeah no downhill downhill is the only way i would like to participate in biking <laughs> me, me too yeah even at like a spin class just turn it this way i don't know yeah. how a spin class works but you know <laughs> just um, put me on a downward incline on a mechanical bike yeah or just put me on a bench and i'll just watch because i actually don't want to be <laughs> actually lie me horizontal on like on the floor and then roll me back roll me to the car and actually, i'll drive just leave home. me alone because i just don't want to change clothes or get out actually, of bed cancel my gym membership actually (laughs) oh i never want to move okay so (laughs) anyway this this young girl decides she's gonna bike home uh see her family it's a three-hour bike ride 30 miles and she told her mom okay i'm leaving around 10 a.m but she never arrived in lewiston so Mm -hmm. she had work and so her family was like you know well she probably went to work and we just haven't heard but her work called, her job called her family and said, where is she? And they mm. said, well, she's with you. And they said, she never showed up for her shift. <laughs> like, try again. I'm yeah, calling tr- you. <laughs> right. Try again, you know. And so this is one of those things where you hear it from a third party perspective and you think, well, what's the big deal? She didn't go to work. But her family and her employer said she has never missed a shift. She has never like no showed or no called. Like she has never... And even her sister described like hearing that she wasn't at her job and thinking something's terribly wrong because in this family, like we call each other, we don't leave each other hanging. So they knew pretty much immediately something was wrong. The problem was she was 22 years old. So police were like, you know, she's an adult. She's a college student. There's every likelihood that she's just, you know, out and about and well, is coming so, back. That's, I mean, I I get both sides, but yeah. like I, as a mother, i would be freaking the fuck out exactly i i waffle between that too because it's like well what the hell like go but then you know there are probably so many instances where it really is somebody just kind of i mean we've talked about it before but like and when i was in college like i was up to a lot of no good and like there were just times where i just didn't answer my mom and she had no idea where i was exactly so I, I, i very well could have been shrugged off as well maybe you just don't know where she is and she's fine yeah and it's horrible because it's like, of course, that's what they wished it were, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it was so much worse. So her family called police and they said, sorry, we have to wait 48 hours because she's, you know, probably just running around and she'll show up eventually. But her family was like, hell no. So they took it into her, their own hands and started a search party. And the way Kristen's mom remembers it, this is also heartbreaking. She said, I absolutely knew we would not find her. I think it was someone that saw her riding along the highway and grabbed her. So Mm. her mom already is losing hope very quickly. Sure. Um, And after several weeks with no answers, you know, things are looking very grim. And her sister said, I gave up hope on July 3rd. And the next day, that's when they found her. So at this point, it's been several weeks. It's 4th of July. Some fishermen find a garbage bag in the Snake River near Clarkston, which is about six and a half miles downstream from the Red Wolf Bridge. And inside this trash bag, they find human remains wrapped in newspaper. Oh, my God. Wow. That. Okay. It's it's upsetting. And, you know, this is a time before cell phones and so it takes them a while to get home and call police and so by the time police get out there it's dark uh but by the next day they were able to you know go out and do more searching and they collected five total bags (gasps) oh my god 
Yes. And these were the remains of Kristen David, unfortunately. Oh, my God. And it's it's horrible, but it's worth noting that, um, you know, after looking at the body and the way it was dismembered, detectives thought the killer seemed to, quote, work with purpose and with knowledge as if he had prior experience. And you want some of the examples that they gave were, you know, a hunter or a butcher, like somebody who knows how to take apart an animal or a person. Oh my God. It's so dark. Uh, it reminds wow. me of actually the Black Dahlia story, just like that gruesome, like precise, you know, precision of this. Yeah. Uh, and when they asked about the newspaper in the documentary, they described it as almost like somebody packing it tightly so that it's not like getting the smell you know, or the evidence like in their car or somewhere oh, like they're trying right. to like keep it contained right um oh. it's just really so sick to talk about uh there's no good way around it so of course this is devastating devastating um to the family to the community and now they're kind of going back and thinking wait shit so this is happening again that somebody disappears a young girl from our area and yeah. like, could this be someone in town so now this fear is just sparked all over again i can't imagine especially in a small town where like you if you don't know ev- if you don't know everybody you at least are always like two de- two degrees away yeah. from everybody and like so I can't imagine walking around looking at every person mm-hmm. being like, is it you? Is it you? Or like your kid says, oh, I'm going to so-and-so's house. And you're like, shit, yeah. like, who's there? Who are their parents? Yeah. Oof. It's 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 something I can't imagine either, but it sounds like a life of honestly constant fear. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I'd just be so anxious all the time. Um, so a man named James Archibald at this point comes forward, and he is perhaps the last person to see Kristen alive. Um, I, I imagine he has some kind of survivor's guilt in a way, but we'll get into it. So basically, he was driving down the highway, and he was passing a van, a brown van with Oregon license plates. Mm-hmm. There was a blonde woman on the ground beside her bicycle next to this man. And he described it as one bicycle wheel was still spinning. Ugh. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. That's like right out of a horror movie. Yes, it is. Ew, it paints a horrible picture. And as he passed, he kind of noticed her and realized she looked to be unconscious. She was not moving at all. The driver was out of the van walking toward the woman, and so this guy, you know, who's driving past thinks, "Oh shit, this man hit the cyclist by mistake." Mm. Um and, you know, my first thought was, "Well, oh, you should stop." But then there's no cell phone so he's like so i right. went to the next town to call police oh right right which okay. makes a lot of sense um you know call paramedics at least 911 call paramedics and so he drives past but what he kind of thinks about later is that as the man oh. turned he saw that the guy had a huge grin on his face <gasps> oh my god ew isn't that f- fucking oh gross my- and he said oh it almost God. like he's much older now. So they interviewed him and this documentary came out in 2018. Um, and, you know, he's kind of remembering and he's like, he had this, he actually described it as a, a big ass grin. And the mm. police officer who's interviewing him was like, he had what? <laughs> like It just seemed almost like an afterthought. How, I can't imagine. Oh my God. There's Ugh. nothing creepier. It's, it's, it's the, oh, I don't even, it's terrifying. It's horrible. Terrifying. And, and they did try to do a sketch. Oh, so anyway, let me just get back to the actual timeline. So he calls 911 and he apparently gets reamed out. He gets in trouble with uh, on, over his CB radio because they're like, what the hell? We like all came out there with paramedics and there's not a single person, not a bicycle, Oof. nobody. And so, you know, why this, would he get in trouble for that? Like, well, I think uh, they were like, what the hell? Like you either gave us the wrong location. Like, I think it didn't occur to them at first that this was he just said, like, he called police. They all rushed over there and they were like, what the hell, man? Like, where where's this? I imagine that was so common, though, back then, if like th- if if you're witnessing a crime and then 10 minutes later cops show up, but it's not there. I feel yeah. like it had to be normal for you know. That's probably true. I guess maybe in this town, it's not like somebody gets right. hit by a car. And yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah, you could see it both ways. But I mean, you're kind of on to something because pretty immediately they were like, oh, shit, no. Like he did see this. It was just a different kind just... of crime than we thought. Mm-hmm. And so, ooh, still gives me the creeps. Um, James, uh, the man who saw saw this incident happen, uh, says, 
quote, had I gone back, would that guy have lied to me and ju just drove off or would I be in the brown van with her? So there's also <gasps> that fear of like, oh, well, God. maybe this guy would have done something to me. Um, yeah. And so he Especially goes. Especially with a grin. Like that guy <sighs> was deranged. Like, deranged. There was, or um, like. Like, what would that guy have said if you pulled over? Like, no, it's fine. It's She's like, my no. child and I'm taking Someone's her home. Ugh, oh, God. It's horrible. Um, and so they did a sketch because, you know, he had seen his face. But when they did the sketch, he said, you know, it was really hard. And the guy tried to keep his face turned away from me as I passed. So he barely caught a glimpse. But he described him as being under six feet tall, about 150. Um, and so that was about as good as they could get as far as, you know, identifying this guy. And so this time, you know, this is obviously just horrific. They've now found her body um, in five plastic bags in the river. And so now the FBI and investigators from both Washington and Idaho and three counties get involved and they do a deep dive on this, find absolutely nothing. Mm. So people are now terrified you know kids are growing up with this like boogeyman in their midst yeah. like they don't know who's going to be next or if they know this guy um and investigators are meanwhile like on edge because they know if this guy got away with it twice he's not going to stop you know yeah, yeah so true. it's almost like a waiting game and Kristen's sister said i felt like the devil had moved into lewiston and i was scared for every human being in that town Hey, yeah <sighs> gives me the serious creeps so they were right because it wasn't long uh september 12th 1982 which was the following year that three people went missing in one night <gasps> three oh three. my god wow that makes you really panic As, like i mean if you live in that right town, strength it's like... in numbers you think yeah yeah and also you would think like oh it's been pretty quiet and now all of a sudden it's worse than we ever thought. It's tripled. Like it's, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, so is, is he now working with other people? Are there multiple people we should be scared of? Or did he have it in him all, all along? Or if I was only scared of one of us being kidnapped right. and now it's three, what if I'm only worried about it being three, but next time it's 10? Like, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Like you don't even know what to be scared of. No. And you don't. And it's almost like this feeling too of like, well, you feel this comfort this like false sense of security if you're with a group or you're with friends and yeah fuck that that's out the window apparently so and another part that like i'm just gonna skip ahead to real quick is that one of these three was a man and he was over six feet tall oh and yeah so that'll do it now there's that fear of like well shit we're not even, even safe with like a physically you know really capable young person to defend us it's mm -hmm. yeah it was just absolutely terrifying for everybody involved um three people in one night so they were from lewiston it was 21 year old christina nelson uh and the first uh the first girl who went missing i'm gonna call chrissy just because it's sure. it's like a lot of chrissy Kristen christina yeah, yeah, yeah so we got a chrissy was the 12 year old girl then Kristen. uh on the bicycle and now we have christina nelson who's 21 and her 18 year old stepsister uh jacqueline brandy who went by brandy miller and they had set out that evening from home to do laundry and go get groceries at the local safeway which was only a few blocks away christina left a note at home to tell her boyfriend where they were going but nobody really knows whether or not they ever made it to their stop um mm. to either stop because they never came home. And so when Christina didn't show up, Christina's boyfriend called the police to report both of them missing. And it was that same night that 35-year-old Stephen R. Pearsall also vanished. Wow. So after a party, Stephen's girlfriend dropped him off at the community theater. It was called the Civic Theater, uh, which, by the way, has since been condemned and looks absolutely terrifying and oh geez utterly creepy and probably very haunted uh so dropped him off his girlfriend dropped him off at the civic theater uh where he worked as a janitor and steven told her i'm gonna do my laundry and i'm gonna practice my clarinet at the theater because it had a nice space for him to practice um and his girlfriend said he was in his usual good mood when she left him and nothing seemed out of place and this is when people started to realize this theater was almost like its own character in the story. It was the focal point all of a sudden because, uh, first of all, these three are linked in a way that they didn't realize at first. So Stephen is actually Christina's neighbor. And they had oh. um, the kind of friendship where it's like a big brother, little yeah. sister friendship. 
And what's more is Christina also worked at the same theater as Steven. Uh, mm. And this theater just happened to be on the way to the grocery store. So okay. Good it, to know. it could be that Christina and Brandy were like, oh, let's pop in and say hi to Steven on our way to the grocery store. Or let's, right. you know, stop in and see who's who's around. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is kind of the going theory. Um, so months go by without any clue whatsoever. Uh, no sign of Stephen, Brandy, or Christina. And, uh, you know, there was a possibility at first maybe they ran away, but pretty quickly that was, like, obviously not what happened. Um, Stephen had left his wallet, uh, some uncashed paychecks, and his car at the apartment, and both women had left their purses and wallets, so it just didn't seem likely that they did this willingly. And investigators said all we had at that time were just three missing people. So they were, like... Mm totally confounded and uh as you said people were more scared than ever especially because one of these people was a you know six foot strong physically capable man and if he wasn't safe then like who is you know yeah even like fathers who were like oh i have to protect my mm -hmm. young children even now for all you know you're both in it's danger. like you're yeah. also a victim right so it, it was very suddenly like that any false sense of security was shattered so during the search, Christina's brother remembers the feeling sinking in that things, quote, probably wouldn't end well. And, you know, he's interviewed throughout this documentary. He cries. It's like the most heart wrenching thing um, to watch all these family members talk about this. So March 19th, 1984, the family gets the news they were dreading, which is that they found Christina's and Brandy's bodies. And their bodies had been found uh, in a rural area outside of Kendrick, Idaho, which was about 40 miles northeast of Lewiston, where they were last seen. Um, both were largely skeletonized. Uh, <gasps> yeah, it's a horrible God. word to say. But they uh, still had clothes and, and personal items like jewelry on them. Mm -hmm. But there was no sign of Stephen. Oh. Intriguing. Okay. Yeah, that immediately throws up some interesting flags. Right? Okay, so that is exactly where their heads went immediately, because they're like, wait a second. These two go missing. We don't know where... St we find them dead. We don't know where Steven is. He's suddenly a suspect in their disappearance or in their murder. So, yeah, or, or he's at least treating his body differently than the women and the girls. And that, that also freaks me out too. Yeah. That's no good either. Um, yeah. obviously, but now they're thinking, well, maybe Steven's the one who abducted them and sure. is on the run, you know? And so Steven's cousin was interviewed and he describes, it's not, like not funny. It's just so bananas, but describes hearing over the radio while driving that his cousin was a suspect in this like double homicide. And he's like, what the hell and he cannot even imagine that this guy is capable of this his sister thought it was like some sort of sick practical joke when she heard the news um basically you know this is kind of cliche but everyone who knew him was like um no like this guy yeah. like his mom even said you know once we sent him to the vet because the dog had to be euthanized and he like could barely hold it together like he could barely function you know letting this dog die let alone like hurting another person which doesn't necessarily prove anything but you know it gives a little character well statement. that's what we all we all hope right that we're at least a person that <laughs> yeah. if we were suspected of murder the people who would be interviewed about us would very confident be confidently be like no that is what way. that's exactly it yeah because that's like, my goal that's my 100 percent. that is the dream because i feel like the alternative is like well he did he was always a little shady or iffy or you know I, there's definitely yeah. uh red flags uh to be had if your mom is saying that about you yeah <laughs> so everyone who knew him thought of him as very soft-hearted very kind um his best friend said i could never see him getting violent i never saw it in his personality i never saw it in his eyes which again you know these are that's a white man maybe maybe somebody doesn't react Someone's to you not the way looking they, at you that way yeah, yeah yeah maybe you just would never have been in that you know sight in that anger so I don't know. It, I'm kind of iffy on that. But here's the thing. There was one more person in the theater the night Stephen, Christina and Brandy vanished. Oh, uh, shit. Who didn't vanish. <laughs> OK. And he admitted to police he was in the theater and he told police he didn't see or hear anything out of the ordinary. Now, in the documentary, this is where it's like kind of 
I had to do a little bit of decision making because I wasn't sure how to approach this. But in the documentary, he is not mentioned because police uh, hadn't like released his name publicly. Oh, OK. But in a 2011 documentary, his name was revealed. It's on Wikipedia. It's on basically any forum about this. So I'm going to say his name because I feel like it's quite relevant and it makes the story easier to tell. I will also give the caveat that this is fully alleged. He has not been charged with anything. Um, He is just a person of interest, which, you know, just means somebody related to this case that police think might have information. So that being said, this man who happened to be in the theater that same night his name is Lance Jeffrey Voss. Okay. Now, Voss says in an interview with police that he was in the attic of the theater working on the light rigging when he fell through the plaster floor. Holy shit. Yes. Wow. Okay. And he says the adrenaline rush gave him the shakes. So he went to the green room to lie down on the couch and that's where he dozed off. So this was his kind of backstory. So for he what. like got out of it. He got away before. So he said he was sleeping in the green room of the theater mm-hmm. uh, and he saw or heard nothing. Right. Okay. Now this is a little shady because Voss said, oh, I didn't even hear Stephen come in. I didn't know if he came in, but police thought that was odd because multiple people saw him enter the theater and his girlfriend who had driven him there saw him enter through the door to the green room like enter into the theater through the door of the green room and from her car saw him turn the lights on Mm. and then she's like okay he made it in and she left and it would be hard to sleep through that but not only that um oh by the way a police officer also saw him entering the theater at the same time so there are multiple witnesses saw him go in but also he was there to do laundry and play his clarinet like i imagine this guy would have woken up if if he steven had gone about his business as planned sure so it's just a little odd it was like they weren't really buying it they were like wait a second this guy's going to play his clarinet and you're saying you slept through him bursting in turning the lights on all this What's i will n- say i can sleep through just that's about true anything. okay you know what that's a great I've point s- i to date i have slept through four fire alarms okay. um <laughs> oh so. god um you need to get it's not a brag. I'm just saying it's because uh, there's nothing to be bragging about there. But I'm just saying anything's possible. When I, it comes also, to I also, I also imagine nap. if you fell through a plaster ceiling, you, you deserve would, a deep nap. You would probably not wake up for a while because you'd be like, I need to recover in my REM cycle. Or like if I if something like that happened, I I just wouldn't want to be bothered. So even if someone came in and turned the light on, I would just that's true. Pre- at least keep pretend sleeping so i didn't have to interact yeah with but them. then when you're at the police station wouldn't you be like oh yeah i saw him come oh, in i was yeah. just ignoring him but yeah that's i see what, i do see what you're saying and i do think that's a fair argument you know maybe he's a really deep sleeper um i'm just saying a good nap can do um, incredible things so you know what you are making a good point and i concede that to you here's the other thing that I think you might have a tougher time explaining, but maybe. (laughs) So it's just a weird coincidence, but Voss, this this person of interest, just so happened to be the last person to see 12-year-old Christina Chrissy White alive two years earlier in 1979. Oh, shut the fuck. Okay, that's, yeah, that's a little wild. That's weird, right? Uh, hmm. A little wild. And I have even more detail because he had actually been dating chrissy's friend rose's mom so he was basically like rose's pseudo stepdad at the time Mm. so when she went to rose's house he was there he told detectives that he was the one to give chrissy a wet towel to cool off before she biked home so Mm. he has already admitted that he was there he interacted with her he was the last person to see her alive and now he's claiming this is all just a big coincidence that he just happens to be you know in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. It's a little Mm. shady. Uh, Apparently his behavior was also a little shady because after Chrissy went missing, he got like really involved, Uh which is just, you know, at first I thought, well, what's the big deal about that? But I guess after hearing officers describe it as like, this is not how a person usually responds. You know, they don't try to insert themselves uh, necessarily unless there's some other motive. Um, I thought it was interesting. He was apparently very insistent about helping the search party, but he also Mm -hmm. kept trying to lead the search parties to specific 
parts of town, um, which almost gave off the vibe of like he's just trying to miss direct where this search party is going. So investigators asked Voss to take a polygraph, but he hired an attorney and the attorney told him to cease all contact with authorities. So he never oh, uh, okay. did a polygraph. In 1990, uh, Chrissy White's case was cold, uh, filed away in storage when a new investigator kind of made that link between Lance Voss and Chrissy's case. And then Lance Voss working at the same theater where three people disappeared on one night. Right, yeah. All of a sudden, he's involved in, like, four of the five. <laughs> four? Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. So, in 1995, investigators announced that Stephen Pearsall, the the third, the man who disappeared, was no longer mm-hmm. a suspect in the uh, deaths of Brandy and Christina. Oh, wow. Okay. So, they started with a whole new theory. And this theory is that Brandy and Christina stopped by the theater on their way to the grocery store. Voss, who also worked there, was there attacked them you know Mm. because he has these predilections or whatever and then steven just happened to walk in to do his laundry and witnessed the crime or the aftermath of the crime interesting and was then killed as a witness because obviously this guy wouldn't want him running his mouth right so that is their new theory um and then where it's weird that they still wouldn't he wouldn't at least bring steven wherever he brought the other women though like, if he killed all of them, wouldn't he just bury all of them next to each other? Or You know, you'd think, but also, you know, there could be an element, and this is not confirmed, but if there's an element of, you know, sexual assault, and it's sort mm-hmm. of like, you know, he has these targets in mind, this guy was just like a, uh, what do you call it, collateral damage. Like, he mm-hmm. wasn't the intended target. Um, you know, he could have treated them differently, so to speak, yeah. Then the guy, like, he could have just been disposed and he wanted to, like, either spend time with the uh, girl, you I, know, or maybe I wonder he kept if them alive. A, like, who knows? I wonder if there was a way to send a, like, a picture of of younger, what, not Steven, the guy, the, the theater guy. Voss, yeah. Voss. I wonder if there was a, a way to show a younger picture of him to the guy who saw a guy grinning mm. running towards the girl. I mean, there are pictures, quite a lot. Um so yeah, I mean it's probably possible somebody I should that get guy went. somebody should get on that. But again, like I mean, and we'll mm. get to this, but like there's so much circumstantial stuff, but nothing like hard, no like real hard hitting evidence. So even mm. if that guy was like, yeah, that does look like him, like it probably yeah, it would wouldn't still be confirm anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is their theory now that he's that Stephen was stumbled into like either a crime scene, the aftermath of a crime. And then was murdered as a witness and disposed of. Um, And so at the time of the crimes, Voss actually owned several properties, including a vacant house near Chrissy White's home. Mm -hmm. He also owned other more rural properties where neighbors had complained in the past of his incessant digging at night. (gasps) Bye. Bye. That'll do it. Are you kidding? I mean, come on. I'd be on. like, can you please point out the spots where you saw him digging? So Seriously. We can go look. Yeah. I mean, it it really is like, and he, so at this point, you know, they're, they're kind of honing in on him and they realize he has recently had concrete flooring poured in the basement. <laughs> See ya. Wow. That's very convenient. I know. But they dug up some of the concrete flooring and found nothing. So it's like they felt like this is it and then they didn't find anything but they are still for obvious reasons convinced this is the police talking uh convinced that he's the culprit so i actually have some other like little anecdotes about this guy just to give more of like a i don't know a well-rounded understanding of how creepy he is yeah um so there was this realtor who apparently was taking a look at one of his properties that he wanted to sell and this is the one with the special basement he had poured a concrete floor in. Oh, so that one. Yeah. He, you've heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> so apparently he was telling this realtor like on and on how great the basement was, how much work he had put into it. And he's like, right this way. Let me show you. OK, this creeps me out so bad. She, he's walking her to the basement. He's like, after you. She turns around to like say something to him and realizes he has his hand raised and he whips his <gasps> hand back behind his back. Truly? fuck no talk about it absolutely nightmare oh my god yeah how quick 
But also at that point, like, how do you even get out? Of, how, I don't I, know. I would be. I, I would I don't accept. Know. I think I'd accept defeat. I think I'd be like, well, <laughs> I think I just witnessed what's about to come. It's so, like, and it's awkward because it's not like you can be like, anyway, I didn't see anything. Like you, li- you know what I mean. Like now you both know that you know that they know. It's oh, it's like it's, it's almost like you're more likely to be hurt now. That's I don't right. Know how- like you are a. It's almost like a witness thing again. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe he thought she just really didn't see what he was holding. Um, but apparently, yeah. She- and maybe she got out of it of like, oh, are you stretching? I like to stretch too. Ah, <laughs> Isn't like- <laughs> stretching the best? I'm gonna stretch yeah. all the way to my Honda outside and leave. Um, <laughs> see you later. Never. I'm gonna go um, ride downhill all the way home on my mechanical bike. <laughs> but downhill only for yeah. the rest of my life because I'm incredibly traumatized. <laughs> And so she turns around just to say, like, oh, so what? And he's fucking ready to bash her brains and presumably this is all alleged to be clear. We don't know what he was planning to do. But so she's like, what are you holding? And apparently he holds up. He shows her what he's holding. And it's a blunt object that looks like it came from, like, a, a bedpost or is, like, part of a bedpost, like a big blunt object. Oh, which my God. Is like, cool. Why are you holding that? Um you know what did he say he just was like oh i was just putting this away it explained it and she got the fuck out of there i don't even i don't even know how you gracefully i don't either disengage because i wish she would explain that to me because i'm like we could all use that lesson of how you got out of there because i would think oh i'm gonna sprint out of here but then obviously you're on to something and and then you're in trouble your foot is blistered so you're screwed and I'm. I couldn't even if I wanted to. I would yeah. have to throw part of my foot skin at him and hope Ew. that got. <laughs> Wait, that would actually probably do the trick. Nobody. That would make him want to kill me faster. He'd look at your foot and be like, "No, get away from me." Um, <laughs> is it contagious? I don't know. Uh, you could just tell him you have my herpes, and maybe he'll leave you alone. But sounds like he uh, he somehow got spooked. Like she. You know what I mean? She's like, so I, lucky. She's so lucky. Yeah, I feel like there's either a luck or she did something right. Or not right, I shouldn't say. But you know what I mean? Like something that disarmed him almost because like the other guy walked in and he was killed. So it's like she he probably could have physically overpowered her. Very, very scary. Um, but again, this is all circumstantial. It's just an anecdote. Like it's not going to prove anything. Um, so here's another. This, this guy... Listen, whether or not he did these specific crimes, he's a creep. So I think I yeah. can confidently say that without getting sued. Um, I'm not positive, but I, I consider creep him is to pretty, be a creep. Creep is a is a vague enough word, I think we're I okay. I feel like, you know. Um, anyway, in June 1972, this is... <laughs> okay let me let me see how to broach this story because it's so batshit crazy okay so let's say he's in an interview with police like i think it's his second interview and they're like hey we're talking to you ha- uh, about these crimes and you're you know on the list of suspects or at least not suspects necessarily but people of interest you might have some information and they're like have you ever been in trouble with the law and he's like well yeah but i was in the wrong place at the wrong time Oh, wow. Heard that one before. Yeah, right. It sounds familiar. And so they're like, hmm, what do you mean by that? And this is where he tells them of an incident in June of 1972 in San Jose, California, at the Willow Glen Mortuary. And this was a funeral home that uh, Voss was caught breaking into. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so inside, inside this funeral home, was the body of 17-year-old Antoinette Anino. And this young girl had gotten into an argument with her boyfriend uh, at a beach outing, and they were sitting on the beach talking, and after 10 or 15 minutes, he told her, you know, once you feel better, once you've calmed down, like, come find us. It was him and her brother and her brother's girlfriend, and he's like, I'm going to go join them. Whenever you're feeling up for it, come back and join us. You know, we'll be up there, wherever they were hanging out. So... A little while later, security comes up to the group and says, oh, we're closing the boardwalk. You know, you guys have to head home. And they're like, "Okay, let's go find Antoinette. We don't know where she is. They go back down to the beach. They cannot find her. So they head home. And it wasn't until 2.30 or 3 a.m. that night that a couple walking the beach saw a body in the water. (sighs) And uh, 
you know, she was wearing a gold watch and a necklace with a cross. She was otherwise totally nude. Uh, there were no signs of her clothing anywhere. Uh, and yet her death was ruled a suicide by drowning, um, presumably Ooh. because of this argument with the boyfriend. Although, you know, the details still didn't add up. People still wonder, like, where did the clothes go? Like, they don't just vanish. It's just so it's it's just an odd story. But so keep that in mind. Uh, her body was in the funeral home and there is an attempted break in. Right. And right. who could it be but this Lance Voss? And so the people who live above the funeral home catch him trying to slash through a screen window uh, mm. and break in. And he's carrying a flashlight, a camera and a knife. <gasps> okay wow and <laughs> wow they it gets worse they ask him what are you doing and he says i'm trying to get in to see my girlfriend one last time <gasps> with a knife girl what are you doing that's no 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 that's wild <sighs> and the other part of it is antoinette was the only body only deceased person in the building so it wasn't like oh he was referencing someone else um he could have, like, maybe gone in to, like, try to, like, because you said he somehow it seemed that these bodies were professionally or expertly butchered. Mm. Like, maybe he was going in, like, thinking he could, like, practice or something on so, a dead body. Here's the theories. Okay. The two main theories that I thought were interesting are, one, he killed her at the beach and mm -hmm. wanted to and you know it was ruled a suicide but like he took her clothes or what have you and he wanted to go in i mean he has a camera with him and it's like pre-cell phone days so presumably take photos um perhaps yeah do more horrible things to her body um and then the other theory is that he didn't have anything to do with her death but he heard that he knew there was a young woman's body in the funeral home and wanted to do something you know, to her assault and it. Then, yeah and the knife was like a precaution in case somebody well i think him the knife something. was just to get through the screens um, oh okay but okay. he he had a camera which is like very unsettling to me like why are you going oh, in to yeah. see your quote-unquote girlfriend one last time and to be clear was not his girlfriend the boyfriend was someone else but um he just kind of said that as an excuse and it was like what do you mean by that and why do you have a camera um Oy. there's no other reason that in the middle of the night you're breaking into a funeral home like there's nothing good yeah, coming of something that something bad's happening so he told police well i was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and that's a fucking something i've never heard come out of talk his mouth about before. a stretch like yeah. come on um stretch. <laughs> a big stretch uh so just really fucking shady and so now we fast forward to 1996 um and there is another weird anecdote that doesn't turn into any like physical evidence but also just gives an idea of how creepy this dude is so it's 1996 um a local girl named crystal she's a teenager and she's interviewed she gives her uh, account of the story she had a very weird experience uh with this person of interest lance voss mm. okay She's out camping with her family in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it wasn't like a regular campsite that people went to. It was just like way out in the middle of nowhere. Just her family, you know, were going there. Just a random spot in the woods by the river. And Crystal's family is fishing near a bridge. But she was kind of standing alone about 50 yards away when a man pulls up in a truck and asks her for directions. And she says, you know, I don't really know the place you're trying to get to or where it is. But, you know, my family's down under the bridge. If you want to drive over and, and ask them, they might know. And so he says, hey, why don't you hop in and I'll give you a ride back to your family? Hey, and, uh, no. Hey, uh, <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. And she's like, that's when I started to get creeped out because it didn't make any sense. Like they're 50 yards away. It's not like you need a ride to get like, mm -hmm. you know that far um and so she's she says immediately she was like this is nothing good um and so she says nope and uh he kind of pieces out mm -hmm. so he leaves uh and she said she thinks he saw her dad and maybe uncle and was like never That's mind this isn't out. Yeah. worth it you know yeah and so he never got his directions he'd never even asked the family so clearly that was not the real intention um, and she left with her parents, but apparently two of her family members, I think it was like an uncle and his wife, stayed to camp the night. And apparently the man came back. So they're mm. at their campsite. And the woman yeah. goes, hey, there's that creepy man from earlier today. And he just what kind of pops his head out 
And oh, again, this that's is worse not, than what I thought was going to happen. Yeah, this is not like a public campsite. This is just so like he's been like ogling them, this lurking. Whole time. Yeah, and so at first the the guy, uh, I think his name was Daryl, did not see anything, and then the guy like popped up again, and this time Daryl was getting like really freaked out. He, yeah, he's like, this guy's lurking around our campsite, and you know, nothing good can come of this. So they kept so they got so freaked out that the gun they kept on hand, um, they grabbed it and held it while they packed up and they left in the middle of the night. They were like, we're not sleeping here. Yeah. So sometime later, I don't know if it was weeks or maybe months later, uh, Daryl and his wife are at a street fair and there's a band performing and they look at the stage and they go, oh, my God, that guy was the one lurking at our campsite. Oh, he's oh god. He's in a band and he's performing and apparently the person next to them at the fucking street fair says, "Do you, do you know who that is? That's Lance Voss, the guy who's like a person of interest in all of these crimes." <gasps> and they're like, "Oh my god," cuz they had no idea that it was the same person. So just like really weird, dude. Um whether or not he's a murderer, which is unclear so far. And it seems like there's a lot of times he said, oh, um, I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that seems to follow him yeah. through multiple times and even a short span he's of time. He's either like the unluckiest like standby to a serial murderer or he yeah. is the luckiest serial murderer because he's getting away it's, with it. It's one of the two. Yeah. yeah, it's bizarre. And like, I think that's the kind of pattern they kept mentioning in the docuseries as well is like there are too many coincidences like it doesn't mm -hmm. it, it's just too much to to write off you know yeah. it's a little too weird that he's so connected to everybody yeah um so as of the documentary uh which like i said came out in 2018 detectives are still convinced that lance voss um is responsible for these five abductions and murders but there is just an absolute lack of physical evidence and like you know, now they're trying to get any DNA they can. Um, they even found his old car that he had driven at the time and tried to find DNA evidence. Mm. But uh, all of this is currently with the FBI. So we don't know if any of these have panned out. Um, mm -hmm. But they are still looking and they are still trying to gather DNA evidence since they didn't have that 30 years ago. And disturbingly enough, several men have tried to confess to Kristen David's mur murder, the one who was dismembered yeah uh, and all of them have been ruled out and it's just that same gross thing of like people confessing to crimes they didn't commit um <sighs> it's it's gross so in 2017 a cold case unit launched a new effort to solve uh the the what do you call it civic theater three i think they called it mm. um which is brandy christina and steven and although they acknowledge a strong link between these cases, the FBI is actually investigating Kristen David's murder separately because they oh. think it might be a different person just based on the way she was dismembered. And it just seemed like a different. That'd MO. be crazy if there were two I know. murders in the same small town that it's, both got away with it. It's wild because like the, the profiler they interviewed from the FBI was like, you know, this is a very specific type of person who dismembers someone like this. And that's part of their whole thing but like the other ones weren't so his theory is that it's two different people um yeah. but then also like that's wild too like you said well there's two of them running around so who yeah. knows but the fbi is treating it separately um but they do acknowledge there you know are links and then finally detective jackie nichols uh who's kind of like the main character of this this show uh she is the uh she is a detective with the Asotan County Sheriff's Office, and she says to this day that she has not given up on Chrissy White. Um, she actually works the case off the clock quite a bit. Oh, wow. I know, and keeps a photo of Chrissy on the bulletin board in her office because she doesn't ever want to forget who she's fighting for. And the families and friends of all five victims, you know, a lot of them have passed, especially the parents, which is mm -hmm. heartbreaking. Um, but they all hope that you know, some piece of evidence will come through and crack the case open and they'll finally be able to bring this to trial. Um, pretty much everyone interviewed, and this might just be a bias of the show, but pretty much everyone who's interviewed was like, I'm confident that that is who did it. And, and throughout the whole show, they say like, they like either bleep out the person's name or they say like the person of interest. Um, but since it's so, you know, widely googleable i figured mm -hmm. it's okay to mention uh who is this suspect is not suspect who is this person of interest that um people are looking at so yeah 
it's wow. uh it's something you know it's, uh, it's wild that there's also no physical evidence it's like how yeah. lucky and unlucky can you get all at the same time if you're getting away with multiple murders and there's no especially let's say that stretch thing where he was going to like yeah. hit that one woman over the head it's like he clearly is if he if that was really what his plan was was to hurt this person he's fine with a little blood splat splatter yeah so like true so like how are you cleaning it up so well like what's happening you know it's I really don't... true that's what one of the things they said too like it would have to ha- he would have to have a space to yeah. feel comfortable doing these things where people aren't gonna see it or catch him um and Wild. you know they interview him they play the old interviews and it's all extra creepy because they put the voice modulator on because it's like they don't want to reveal this person's identity um but the, he says he says all these weird details when they're discussing like okay so you fell asleep on the couch in the green room and they're asking these questions and he's responding and he he has all these weird details that are like a little strange like why would you say that like for example he said oh i heard the phone ringing but i didn't answer and the detective nichols she's convinced that it's because either his wife because he was married either his wife said to him like oh i called and you didn't pick up yeah. and so he could say oh yeah i heard it but i was napping or there's some right. you know he's trying to fill in the gaps before people you know ask more questions um but it's just a very strange story and you know yeah. again as I of also, now he's innocent until proven guilty but we'll see i also wonder like if it was him how why would he go why would he have a moment with uh the the first the very first victim? Mm-hmm. Why would he have done that? And then it was so apparently expertly mm-hmm. you know handled by him at the end that it's it implies there's more that we never saw. Yeah. And then why would there be this massive gap where he didn't do anything yep. at least that we know of yep. and then he goes into three people like it's all the behavior is just all over the place it's all over the place and like that is also another pattern throughout the whole show that pretty much everyone agrees there is no way that this is his only these are his only yeah. crimes there's no way it's only isolated to this area because he moved from chicago um right. there's no way that it's that he stopped and hasn't done anything unless he's like physically incapable or there's some other reason um yeah. but like the profiler said like his compulsions would not be kept in check if you know yeah so i don't know it's very disturbing to think about this person still out there um and again we don't know that it was this guy he's just somebody that the victim's families are are eyeing um and the police yeah. are eyeing but we don't have any hard evidence uh, so, you know, until we find that or not we, but somebody smarter than me, um, <laughs> we don't know. Wow. So Great that's why story. I said it's a cold case ish. Cause I was like, a lot of people are like, we know who did it, but obviously yeah. we don't really, um, for legal <sighs> purposes and otherwise. It's, <sighs> it's, a, it's a good story, but horrible that it's a I real know. story. I know. Um, I wish it were fictional. I wish I could say just kidding. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you for the the bum out I was hoping for. You're so, so glad. <laughs> welcome. I hope I you was feel a little great. too happy today. So that's right. I saw it in your eyes. I went the glint, the glint of joy, and you were like, "Let's bring you back down to earth. Let's yeah. extinguish it." Oh uh, well. Uh, to end on a happy note, I found one of my old uh, magic tricks. Oh, whoa! And it changes colors. I bring it with me on like planes and stuff to like entertain babies because then I hope they won't cry, you know. Aww. But I don't think babies understand the concept. So I but mean, I don't amazed... would be all. I don't think you're supposed to understand the concept. I think that's the fun of a rainbow scarf. <laughs> I guess so, but I I like to think like, oh, if I had, if I were sad and someone had this on a plane, yeah. I'd watch them for like an hour. Wait, maybe like, this crazy. is our new ending. You just do a little magic trick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well. I- maybe sure i guess audio wise it doesn't do much for people but (laughs) it's me it's me tugging on a scarf and it not so magically changing colors before everyone's eyes it's pretty magical Um, to me but anyway i i found this i've been i've been digging through my closets and organizing my cabinet so i'm i'm finding a lot of good little trinkets so hopefully um i find something Actually, I found one already that's supposed to be a gift for you, and I forgot to give it to you for Christmas. So Ooh. you've got you've got things coming for that got, birthday of yours in uh, less than a month. Less than a month till both our birthdays. When does this come out? When is oh, our shit. birthday episode? I hope this isn't it. 
Uh, let me look. Episode? 329. Oh, can you imagine? Is it? Oh, no. It's the, it's the next one, though. Our birthday is next episode? Yeah, 330, which is comes out Sunday, June 4th. So your birthday <gasps> was last night. So it came out at midnight between our birthdays. Oh, come on. Oh Do you know what that means? That it's so that means it'll be my time, my birthday, your time, your birthday, Pacific. It comes out on both our birthdays. That's bananas. Wow. That's so adorable. when you hear this, I'm 31. But this ah! is coming from a 30 year old voice. So maybe I sound very petite you do you sound know? very youthful i can, i do say you do thank you uh wow okay so we should figure out something to do for your for the b-day oh wait episode. i just realized never mind this comes out yeah it comes out the week before our birthday so you will not be 31 yet it, you'll oh, be 31 shit. next okay. week <laughs> next week you will hear me speaking with a the voice of a 31 year old yeah yeah and i'll we'll have to figure out something and i'll have to come up with something because last time no two times ago was her scene shifter and i can't Oh, do that again that'd be oh, too geez. obvious so. yeah oh man well we'll see what i conjure up <laughs> me too i'm like uh-oh <laughs> ah. all right and that's why we drink <laughs>